Welcome back to Talking in the Library. This is Kim Beal, and I'm starting a slightly different project here where we're doing a more live conversation with little editing and lots of talking about pictures. So I'm happy to be joined today by Chris Dorley Brown, who has chosen the book Carambolage by Arnold Odermatt. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Kim. Hi there. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about your work and where you're based? I'm based in London and I've been photographing almost exclusively in London for the last uh, ooh, 35 years. Uh, gets a bit scary when you think about it, but it's a long time. Uh, and I, I guess you'd call me a documentary photographer. I do a little bit of editorial work, but um, mostly I'm wandering about with a camera. Um, my work is an archive in my mind. That's how I think about it. Um, I self commission as opposed to waiting for someone to ask me. Uh, so the subjects I can choose quite freely, but basically it's a kind of topographical and social record of the East End of London from the mid 1980s until the present. All right. Well, there are already so many parallels between your work and how you describe it and that of Arnold Odermatt, who was a Swiss photographer um, who was employed as a police photographer and he recorded traffic accidents um, during his career that spanned from 1948 to 1990. And this book is the result of a selection of those photographs um, chosen and identified by his son, um, Urs Odermatt, and it's published by Steidl. So we'll look at a couple pictures. And as we get into some of these introductory images, maybe you can tell us, Chris, what was it that inspired you to choose this book? Well, um... Uh, thank you for asking me to choose a book. I mean, no one's ever done that before. Um, I was uh, suddenly a bit kind of flummoxed by the idea. I had to choose a book. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Arnold's book, which is kind of on my shelf in Pride of Place. And that suddenly occurred to me that, that it had to be that one. Um, and it's an, I, I guess on looking at it first off, it might be regarded as quite a strange uh, publication uh, a bit um, well you know uh, a bit horrific in content maybe um, but it it's balanced by its very kind of uh, ordinariness and mundane um, everyday life um, which is kind of embedded in these pictures which is all cars in the aftermath of quite a serious car accident and uh, Arnold, as you said, was a was a policeman and was commissioned um, by his um, his unit to uh, record, document the ev uh, the the aftermaths of these crashes, so they would be used in evidence in uh, in court if it uh, if it came to that. Uh, quite a standard practice, I imagine, in police forces around the world. Um, what struck me about these was first off that they almost look staged and when I first saw them I thought what's going on here these don't look like uh, just regular police photographs they look they look artful they look constructed they look composed and you could say in some way that they're very beautiful um, which I still think they are uh, despite the subject matter which is um, not beautiful at all we're, we're looking at pictures where people were possibly injured and uh, may, maybe killed. Um, we don't know. There's no details on that. And at the time I first saw the book, I knew nothing about Arnold or uh, the phenomena that his, um, his son, Urs, um, turned him into, which was kind of like an art star. Um, I think these pictures were first seen to a wider public at the Venice Biennale in 2003 and um, they'd been buried for a while by then um, and Arnold's son Urs had um, persuaded his father to get them out um, of his uh, of his archive his collection where they'd been buried and to make a presentation of them in uh, well the Venice Biennale that's uh, one of the most famous um, 
you know, exhibitions, art exhibitions in, uh, in the world. So I think they were instantly taken very seriously and taken, uh, they were seen by a very wide audience at that point. Um, and that's where I came across them and my wife bought me the book. Um, and I don't look at it that often, to be honest, because, uh, you know, one, I suppose, you know, you know, uh, once, once you once you have a book and you've looked at it a couple of times, they kind of tend to go on a shelf and you they reside in your memory much more than they do in your present. But I'm I'm certainly had an effect on me, um, an inspiration, um, which was a collection of, you know, uh, a systematic um, approach to photography, which I think in those days was becoming more prevalent due to the, you know, the, the Dusseldorf School, the uh, Berndt and Hiller Becker collection. Um, so it was very timely in a way that these emerged at that point. Um, and I guess it's always also worth mentioning that maybe my interest in them was spurred by the fact that uh, my dad, when I was a kid, my dad drove a breakdown truck. So it would be called out in the middle of the night to go and uh, attend accidents and uh, tow the cars back to his place. Um, mostly my elder brothers were involved in that. So my, my whole youth was kind of taken up with stories of gruesome things found at the scenes of car accidents. Um, mm. Usually I got to see the wrecks later on when they were in his yard. So I'd sit in these cars and look at the, the broken glass and the sometimes blood stains and kind of imagine the horror that had taken place. And I was sitting in the seat um, like a couple of days later before the cars were taken away, um, which I suppose led me to consider it even more when J.G. Ballard bought how its book Crash, mm -hmm. uh, which was turned into a movie by, uh, was it Steven Soderbergh? No, uh, Cronenberg. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and... I kind of thought, wow, I'm not the only one who's got this kind of perverse obsession with car accidents. Right. Um, it's like people say, the rubberneckers, you can't stop staring at it as much as it's hard to look at. Yeah. And I think, I, I, to be honest, I'd never really done any research on Arnold or the, the history of the book. And uh, it was only when you invited me to talk about it that I kind of went back to it and took another look and um, did a bit more background research into it. Um, and I've kind of found it fascinating all over again. Um, my, my own personal work doesn't quite follow the same pattern, um, but I think it's always there in the background um, in, in a way that the, sen the sensation of them is kind of, is, is subdued in a, in a strange way. And what we get is, uh, is really um, a selection of landscapes of that part of Switzerland where he was working, the central part of Switzerland, which is mountainous, it's in the Alps, by, um, by the lake. Uh, and in a way, I think they're a very kind of accurate picture of a post-war Europe, may maybe, um, transferable to like a, a more universal, more like a worldwide attitude, I guess, created by mobility, um, the automobile itself, the car, um, and the after effects of when things go wrong. Um, so uh, to me, I read them as a collection of documentary photographs in the same way that the systematic photograph does kind of work as evidence and these pictures were made as evidence, clearly. Um, they really right. serve no, no other purpose, um, but now they serve a multitude of purposes, I would say. Yeah, it seems like evidence of so many things. Like you say, you know, we see that changes in society. I noticed particularly how often there's a collision between 
older cars and newer cars. Um, and it uh, seems to be making present that change in time. And we also see different roads um, and old ways of life, um, giant bales of hay, and there's a wooden farm barrel that's crashed into a car on a highway. And it seems like there are these different ways of life that are crashing into each other too. Yeah, um, it, it, it is like that. The car, the car almost becomes human. Um, in its kind of the way it responds to any kind of confrontation um, and the vulnerability of the automobile is kind of echoed in what you suspect the vulnerability of the people inside it were mm. uh, maybe in a different way than other car wreck pictures that we know of probably by Ouija and then they were kind of appropriated by Warhol um, the police photographs that were kind of concentrated maybe more on the kind of visceral horror and sometimes with the human remains kind of inside them, which none of these pictures have. I mean, there's not one single picture of any of the uh, passengers or drivers, um, but uh, which kind of serves to kind of uh, alleviate the horror of them maybe and turn them into more of a, uh, of a social document. Um, which right. I guess his son was uh, was kind of aware of, and maybe Arnold was too closely connected with them to present them as photography or as art. They were more of a personal a record of his work that I suspect that he probably felt quite guilty about and maybe a, a little bit ashamed about that he was uh, kind of witness to such um, kind of intimate, kind of destruction um right so maybe that was my, of yeah, go Sontag on. saying that um time eventually makes all things and all kinds of photographs into art yeah absolutely um and uh, a certain amount of time i guess had needed to elapse before um a general public kind of had the stomach to embrace them as as uh, as as beauty Mm -hmm. rather than just evidence or just horror. Right. Or it's certainly, um, you know, a kind of beauty that is aware of the world. Um, if it's not, uh, you know, what we typically think of as beautiful, it's, you know, recognizing the forms as they exist in the world. And that includes the social forms and um, even, you know, the form that death may take. Yeah, and the, the, on, the only collection of pictures I can think of which I have a similar attitude is to the the record of the London Blitz from the Second World War which were also made by a couple of policemen working as a team called Cross and Tibbs um, and they were um, they were sent out to record the bomb damage the morning after the the bombs had dropped in London and that that collection now is held by the London Metropolitan Archives Mm -hmm. And they kind of have a similar kind of resonance to them, um, but enough time has passed for the, the immediate horror to have kind of dissipated. Now we somehow can reflect on the aesthetic. I'm interested in many of the pairings and you can see it here um, to a small degree, but occasionally there are two pictures that take two different angles. And I'm so unused to that um, because of the conventions of filmmaking that require that we never cross the 180 degree line so we don't get confused about where people are oriented in the scene. And here it's very clear, you know, we're zooming in on this car and taking a slightly different angle on it. But there are a number of pictures where it's, it's hard to tell if there's a relationship between the two cars. Um, and sometimes we see the same car from different perspectives so that it looks like a different car. So we'll see if we, or here, you know, maybe we're tricked into thinking, well, is that, is that the same car at different times in its life? And of course you can read the clues and notice the license plates. Yeah, I guess it's one of those cases where the photographer themselves don't really take part in the sequencing and the design of the book that was done by uh, Gunther Schneidel and uh, Urs. Um, so, and uh, the Arnold's son is a filmmaker and photographer. Um, so those kind of considerations arose. Maybe um, 
Arnold obviously had to get coverage uh, of mm -hmm. the situation from many angles um, in the same way that you would get coverage if you were shooting a movie and needed to <laughs> have right. a few options, you know. Yeah, uh, here that kind of experience is very clear to me. It's um, hiding in the gutter. You have the scene between these two pictures, yeah. which almost at, at a quick glance, it looks like it could be one street with two cars, but in fact, it's the same street with the same car. Yeah. And you notice how many people were driving VWs. <laughs> yes, or how particularly prone to accidents they were. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, well, I don't know if you've ever driven one, but I had one for a few years and uh, yeah, they tended to uh, be a bit temperamental sometimes. And I think they were even referred to as tin coffins. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I only smashed mine up twice. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are to talk about it. When I'm glad for that. Yeah. So we've got a few pictures that you and I have chosen. So maybe we'll go to a couple of those sequences. Yeah. Um, here is one of yours. Can you tell me what inspired you to look closely at this pair? Well, I've done quite a bit of traveling in the Alps and um, as a cyclist and as a driver. Uh, and every now and again, you either go through a tunnel or a kind of semi-covered section. There might be a bridge over it or like a new road goes over an old road. Um, and as a cyclist, obviously you'd stick to the old road. Um, so you kind of, you, you beat an ancient path through this, through this kind of landscape, even though there's a much quicker way through it if you want. Um, and there's a certain kind of light, there's a certain atmosphere that these overhead passes create. Sometimes they go on for miles and miles, they're built into the side of the mountain. And when you're driving on them, you've really got no room for error. You know, if, uh, if you come off it, you're either going down a, the hillside of a mountain or you're smashing into a pillar or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine that was quite a kind of common place where mishaps used to take place in this particular world. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought those two were a good, were a good kind of, um, a good way of emulating that, that, that mood that you get in the, Al in the Alpine countryside. Um, For me too, these columns are so interesting in the way they combine the past and the present. Yeah, and they're so unforgiving, you know, you, the, mm -hmm. You hit those with a car and they ain't budging, you know, like your car is going to be the one that absorbs all the energy. Uh, right. And I guess being a European myself, the kind of uh, the, the, hist the history of Europe is so, for my generation, was so bound up with the Second World War because it was a war between European countries that when you traveled through Europe, even even nowadays you get a trace of it, but in the 60s and 70s, when I started traveling through it uh, with my folks or then, then later on on my, my, on my own, um, the, the kind of the specter of, of war and damage and horror was always kind of there in the background. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of om omnipresent specter, if you like, um, that this, the, the whole kind of uh, the landscape and the way you navigate it and the experience of going through it is kind of dictated to by um, a, a very turbulent kind of political history. Um, it's, right. it's a very strong sensation to me because I went through it originally with my father who was a soldier in that war and a prisoner of war in that war. Um, so I'm I'm very I'm very bound up in the whole um, uh, um, detritus, the fallout. You know, the, it's still going on in my mind. You know, the um, the evidence, like these right. pictures produce, it's still very much with me. And it, it, when you when you're photographing in London, it's still absolutely to the forefront. You you can't really forget it because of the, mm -hmm. the, the way the architecture is arranged and the streets are arranged. Uh, it's, um, 
yeah, it's always there. Yeah, that's fascinating. And also to think of the relationship between you and your father and between Urs and his father, you know, traveling through these landscapes and having seen them in different ways. And here we've got, you know, as you're describing it to me now, it, you know, this looks like a fence. It's not barbed wire, but certainly we've got a torn up field, which is, you know, familiar from those earlier landscapes too. Yeah, and maybe something about Switzerland, because they were always kind of in a position of neutrality. I think they still are really. They're not a member of the EU. They didn't participate in the war. Um, so it was like a sort of no man's land in the middle of it, right in the mm. dead center of Europe, mm -hmm. um, which kind of made, maybe there was kind of left you space to reflect on it, um, that it was a place that largely escaped the effects of the war and somehow maybe was an image of what the rest of Europe would have been like without it. Um, mm. I don't know, I may, <laughs> I'm making this up as I go along, but it was only when you uh, kindly invited me to look at this book again that I, I, I really kind of thought about all these things, to be honest. Right. Well, I think that's one of the great things about looking at books with other people is that you take another perspective. You have the awareness that somebody else is looking over your shoulder. And so that's why I so appreciate doing these interviews. This is well, one of my favorite pairs. Um, yeah. I'm so used to seeing the lines drawn on the pavement to determine where the cars had braked and where they collided. And here, you know, their lines are drawn by nature, which are actually is also the thing that caused the accident, probably. Yeah. And, you know, the, that this is a place that would be under snow for maybe two or three months every year. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the winter probably would have been icy, quite treacherous. Um, so, uh, I guess it was everyday life to, mm -hmm. to, to Arnold. As a policeman, it, would have, it wouldn't have been anything extraordinary. That was his job. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the car crash was a kind of, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a cultural phenomenon as well as being uh, a, just a fact of everyday life that uh, the way these things um, absorb energy and dissipate it um right. ostensibly to protect humans but in fact um they're, they're the the sound and the image of crumpled metal there, there's nothing more kind of brutal that's right yeah it's it's sickening it's such has such a deep resonance and I'm, I'm glad you bring it up too because the pictures seem so still and really quite silent um I mean, and I'm reminded of snow too, how quiet it is driving along in snow. Yeah. Um, and yet these, these big thuds must echo across that landscape. Absolutely. So we've got another one of our choices coming up. Oh, this is one of mine. Um, which was fascinating to me for its ghostly quality, that it was unclear to me what was being photographed. It's not the accident, but it's the evidence of the accident, perhaps where the shoulder and the guardrails were crashed in. Yeah, which is very similar to the previous pair that we looked at, which was in the snow and looks almost mm -hmm. like the same location. Um, mm. Yeah, where, where a car has kind of hit the guardrail and bounced back. And sometimes they, you know, they're there for years before they get repaired. And there's always this kind of evidence of the trauma taking place um, in the past, uh, which kind of causes you to think. Um, you know, it reminds me of Robert Frank uh, coming to the United States and his focus on roadside crosses. You know, he'd grown up in Switzerland and seen, you know, probably crashes like this in a landscape like this. Yeah. Um, and then to see those cr crosses memorializing the accidents, um, I think clearly made an impact on him. Yeah, and I think um, I was reading somewhere that Arnold was very inspired by Werner Bischoff, who was one of the original, uh, well, not one of the original Magnum photographers, but joined Magnum shortly after the formation. Um, and 
there is a very stylistic relationship between Bischoff's work and Arnold's work, if you like. Um, but I, I guess another thing that comes through when looking at this book is that uh, you're, you're not looking at a photographic career. <laughs> you're looking at um, a, a job and you're looking at a very obsessive way of documenting it, but you're not looking at someone who's wanting to have these pictures seen by a wider audience. Right. Um, so they're incredibly, they're incredibly private in a way. They maybe would have only been seen by a handful of people um, or maybe just Arnold himself if the pictures never came to light in a courtroom. Um, they, he intended no one to see them. Um, and I think there's something about that which generates a kind of intimacy, which is unusual in photography because most photographers want the most amount of people to see what they do. Um, right. And I think that comes across in the way that they're put together. There's almost a kind of no holds barred kind of confrontation with the subject. Um, mm. And uh, I, I find that absolutely fascinating that we, we are looking at possibly an obsession, um, possibly one that's quite perverse even, um, rather than a, a, a career, if you know what I mean. I think it also reminds me just how um, various photography is, that there are many types of careers in photography or that use photography that we don't associate with being a photographer. Um, and that some of those images, yeah, may not be seen, but may only be filed away. Yeah, and I guess we live in an age now where we more or less every day we're seeing a, a, some kind of revelation on that score of historical photographs as as they come to light. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm, the Vivian Meyer ones, I guess, the most famous um, in that sense that it took 40 years before we saw them. Um, but I remember thinking at this time, uh, it's... I, 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 I divide my time up between um, making books and editing books of other people's work, which are generally been unseen um, by other people. Um, and the, the act of discovering these archives and seeing them for the first time is <clears throat> just as thrilling as making your own pictures, if not more so. Um, mm. It doesn't really kind of matter in the end who took them. It's it's the context in which you see them in. Um, yeah, that's felt very clearly in this book, I think, through the sequencing and the pairing of photographs really creates a story that you're quite aware of when you're looking at them. Yeah. I've noticed that um, there's, there's quite a few YouTube videos of Arnold like going on chat shows. Um, I mean, sadly, he only died last year. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, quite up until recently, I think it was quite common for him to appear on a Swiss chat show, you know, as a guest to talk about his um, photographs. So he's kind of, uh, you know, he, be he became a sort of uh, an, an unwitting kind of star of the art world um, in his later life, um, which must have gone against all expectations um, right. of, of how things turned out. Um, these, in fact, if you want to just pause on that one, you've just passed. I know it wasn't one of the ones I wanted there. There's not many taken at night there, but um, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a photograph of uh, one of his um, colleagues holding up like a big bowl of uh, magnesium powder, which he would like uh, yes. match. And they would burn for about like that? 10 seconds, give, give him enough time to do the night shots. Right. Um, which is like a really ancient kind of uh, something, you know, um, you know, O. Winston Link. Um, yes. Uh, the way those huge kind of landscapes were lit um, with the multitude of ancient flash guns. There's something there's there's something similar, similar about these and 
Lynx work, even though the Lynx work are very sort of there, yeah, that one, yeah. Uh, you know, how do you get a spectacle in a photograph at night? You need, you need a sudden burst of light. Right. Um, and that in itself is quite an incredible image. It, it kind of says it all really. If you, if you just had to look at maybe one or two pictures by Odermatt, that may be some, sums up the entire collection in some ways, you know, how he worked, the way he positioned himself, the camera. An incredible drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I wonder why that is. It's, it's kind of uh, an incredible drama created out of the most mundane and, and uh, unfortunate circumstances. Right. Right, yeah, I mean, there are no other facts of our lives, right? Except that we are born and then we die. Yeah. And we do something to make it meaningful in the, in the meantime. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly, you know, organizing experience and being obsessive about something. I think this is, you know, the hallmarks of someone who is a working to make meaning and to participate in their community and to, I mean, this is, it's a hard thing um, to be a witness um, and especially to be witness to such a, a moment of trauma um, and then to see it haunt the landscape ever afterwards, right? You know, it's, this yeah. is his community. And it says something about the nature of the photographer themselves, that they are a certain kind of person, maybe they're uh maybe they are a bit sociopathic and a bit obsessive. Um, and the way they participate is, is this way. Right, yeah, there's, you know, there's a question about observing versus participating. But, you know, just like when students ask about, you know, how they should become great artists. And I think it's as important that we have great viewers um, and certainly great patrons. We need people to look at art as much as we need people to make it. Yeah. I can't remember where the quote comes from, but uh, it was definitely to do with photography. And it came from a student who asked the photographer you know what the secret was like what how do you make a great photograph and the answer was well it's nothing to do with the uh, you know it's nothing to do with the camera or what's in front of you it's it's all about um which, which direction you point the camera in at what and and when mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which i is is very true as far as i'm concerned uh i'm not that interested in the technicalities of photography that much um, and I don't really take portraits so I don't need someone to be in front of the camera at the particular moment um, but, but as your work proves there's lots of questions to be asked by what and when <laughs> those there are not simple answers to either of those yeah and it gives you an excuse to just step out into the world and look at it um, for what it is um, mm -hmm. with, without any further complications. Um, and maybe uh, in some ways, maybe a policeman is the, is the closest um, thing to a photographer in that sense. Right. That their, okay. job, their job is to sort of like to check stuff out and keep an eye on things. Um, right, a trained observer. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for thinking through this book with me and looking through it with me. And I think it's it certainly has given me a new perspective on, you know, how we relate the mundane to these much greater, greater themes. I'm, I'm really pleased to have had this time with you. Well, thanks, Kim. I was real. It was great for me to do because um, it, it reminded me that uh, now and again, you have to take one of those books off the shelf and look at it and remember why you liked it so much and what effect it had on you. So um, very grateful. Thank you.